Good morning. Good to have you with us again today. We're glad to be together. We're in Revelation chapter 19. This is a this is a glorious chapter. This is this is the moment we are all looking forward to and will be a part of as the Church of Christ, the second coming of Christ. Uh, this is a day of uh, a moment of victory. All of the scriptures, the Old Testament, the New Testament, have looked forward to this day, this moment that John describes here in Revelation chapter 19. And so here we are in verses 11 through 21, and we simply are at a pinnacle moment. Really, the history of mankind as we know it comes to an end at this moment. And God then begins to, after this, will institute his kingdom, his millennial kingdom, his rule, his reign here on earth for a thousand years, which will simply and seamlessly move into an eternal kingdom forever and ever. So we come here to chapter 19, take your Bibles, turn to chapter 19, we're going to be there together, and uh, let's see what the Lord has for us today. My prayer is that uh, God will encourage your heart and challenge you as well. The book of Revelation is to be a challenge to us, is to always remind us that the Lord is coming, He is control, He will fulfill all of the prophecy in the Word of God, and He will divide the peoples between those who have put their faith in Him and those who have not. Uh, it reminds us that we are to live today because people need the Lord. We are to live today with the hope that we have in Christ. It is a certainty that you and I have. And the glimpses of moments like this are just reminders to us that, that God, through Jesus Christ, is in charge. And He will do all that He promised that He will do. The second coming is really all about the victory, victorious return of Jesus Christ. He returns in power. He returns in victory. That's what we see here. We see a setting, we see a setup here in, in this uh, narrative, in this chapter, uh, what's going to take place. We have a conquering hero. We have the hero of heroes. Uh, we have, as it were, the king of kings. Uh, Revelation 19, 11, and I saw, and heaven opened, and I saw heaven opened. And behold, a white horse and one who is sitting on it. And so there we have, here we have Jesus Christ coming out of heaven, Heaven has already been, the heavens as the world knows it, has already been uh, uh, scarred and changed by the judgments of God here in the tribulation. And now and now he opens and splits hope, uh, heavens open, and here he appears. And then in contrast to that, we see in verse 19, And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth with their armies gathered to make war against him who was sitting on the horse and against his army. Jesus returns victoriously. We have the setting here. We have Jesus coming on a white horse with the armies of heaven. We have the, we have the, the beast, the Antichrist, the false prophet with the armies of the earth, hostile forces against each other, the moment of, of all prophecy coming together. That's the scene that we have here. And as I mentioned, Jesus here, as he comes, he is fulfilling the word of God. He is fulfilling prophetic word. Just a couple quick glimpses, just to see, just to see the authority of this moment, the power of this moment, uh, the awesomeness of this moment. In Daniel, we see it unfold. In those days, the days of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that shall never be destroyed. See, that's what Jesus is doing here. Nor shall the kingdom be left to another people. It shall break in pieces all of those kingdoms, and the kingdom of the Antichrist is now the pinnacle of all those kingdoms, and bring them to an end, and it, his, shall stand forever. Chapter 7 of Daniel, you will see this. And I saw in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, there came one like a son of man, that's Jesus Christ, and he came to the Ancient of Days, and he was presented before him, and to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom and that all peoples and nations should serve him and his dominion is an everlasting dominion and it is now beginning here at this moment which shall not pass away his kingdom is one that shall not be destroyed he is now overthrowing the pinnacle of man's kingdoms this is this is the the fulcrum point the this is the this is the highest that man has ever achieved. Man is under the rule of one king. It is a global globalistic uh, kingdom, and Jesus is going to come. He has allowed humanity to have what they've always wanted: this global system, this global rule under the power of the Antichrist. What they wanted clear back in Genesis chapter eleven at the Tower of Babel, and He will destroy humanity. He will destroy that system. And he will institute a kingdom that will be eternal. 
He is, we've seen here, he is bringing an army with him. We're going to be a part of this, folks. Uh, this is going to be a, a glorious moment. Revelation 19, verse 14. The armies of heaven were arrayed in fine linen, white and pure. They were following him on white horses. That's us, folks. And, and we're, we're a part of this, this, this army that's coming with Jesus Christ. We're on white horses. We have, been, we have been made whole in Jesus Christ. We are righteous before Jesus Christ. We are now holy before Jesus Christ. We are the bride of Christ. All of these things. But there is an angelic host that I believe is a part of this as well. Matthew chapter 25, verse 31. When the Son of Man comes in His glory and all the angels with Him, then He will sit on His glorious throne. It's going to be the armies of heaven, the angels of heaven, the church, the bride of Christ, 1 Thessalonians 3, 13. He has established our hearts. He has made us blameless in holiness before God his Father, here at the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ with all His saints. He is now coming. He's coming with all the saints. He's coming with the church. We are coming back with Him. You know, He has an army behind Him. He's on a white horse. He's coming. There, there is an army beyond numbers, innumerable behind Him. And yet, we're going to be spectators. The fight will be His. The victory will be His. He will, do the, he will go to battle. He will win the war. He will, do, he will do the work here. We will simply spectate and watch and rejoice with Him as He wins and brings the, the glory. He's coming in power. He's coming in glory. If you have your Bible, take it. We're going to look at this, how significant this is. Revelation chapter 19. And let's, let's see how he describes this beginning in verse 11. So heaven opened a white horse. That white horse is, <clears throat> has always been... In the time of John, as he was writing, the white horse was a symbol of absolute victory. The generals would, would conquer the nations and conquer kingdoms. They would bring the spoils of war back with him. They would bring the, the, uh, the prisoners of war back with him. They would, they would march into Rome in victory. The, the general would be on a white horse. The horse of, it symbolized absolute power and victory. And Jesus Christ is coming on this white horse in absolute victory. The one sitting on it is called faithful and true. And here we have a contrast to the character, uh, the, with the character of Jesus Christ, to the character of the Antichrist, the beast, Satan himself. Jesus Christ is faithful. He's been faithful to his word. He has been true to his word. Everything that he has ever said has been truth. And that truth is being carried out. That truth is being fulfilled. Satan, the Antichrist, is a liar, is unfaithful, has broken his promises, has broken covenant. Jesus Christ, just the opposite. And he judges in righteousness, he judges and makes war. Everything that Jesus Christ does is right. He always does the right thing. And, and in that justice, he now brings the war, a holy war, the war against sin, the war against sinners, to win that victory. That's what he's doing. What he is doing is right. It has always been right. It is the filling of the word of God. His eyes are like a flame of fire, and his eyes are 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 filled with a, with the purity of his holiness. That's what we see here. Um, before which no man can stand. None of us can stand before the ultimate holiness of God. And he is coming with that absolute holiness. He's coming with that absolute fire of judgment, the fire of, of God's righteousness to bring against a sinful man and a sinful world. Man cannot and will not be able to stand. On his head are many diadems. That diadem, that is the crown of sovereign royalty. Um, it is it is royalty. It is not the, is not the word. Uh, it is not the crown of victory. Although this is this is this is a moment of victory. Uh, the crown of victory is uh, uh, Stephanus, which we saw the Antichrist was given. He is that. He does have that. But this is more than that. This is the crown of inherent right uh, to rule and to reign. It is inherent divinity to rule and to reign. It, it is it is all about Jesus Christ and his inherent right to do what he's doing here his authority in every way many many diadems many crowns he is the he is the god he is the king over all kings and the lord over all lords and he is 
He has won victories throughout history. This is the ultimate. This is the final victory. The victory that was won at the cross is now being realized. And he has, he has a name written that no one knows but himself. So what can we say about this name? We don't know anything about it. There is a name that is written that describes somehow him, what he's doing. We don't know what it is. We don't know what it says. We don't know its meaning. It is mysterious. And, and it just shows us again that, that God is incomprehensible, that Jesus Christ is incomprehensible. The very Lamb of God that we see walking on earth in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John is also the same God who is indescribable and has a name that no one knows but himself. He is clothed in a robe that is dipped in blood. This is not the blood of the cross. This is, the, this is not the blood of grace. This is not the blood of 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 the covering of sin this is the this is the this is the blood attained through warfare this is the blood of his enemies this is a king this is a general this is a, a going into battle and being splattered with the blood of his enemies it is the blood of his righteous war and his righteous victory that's what this is uh, this is not a moment of of grace as it were this is a moment of judgment and this reflects that as well and he has a name by which he is called. That name is the Word of God. Uh, he, is, he is the Word that was there at the beginning of time. He is the uh, incarnate Word that became flesh. He is the living Word. He is, he is the Word of power, the Word of God. And with his Word, he will win the victory. He doesn't need weapons and tanks and missiles and satellites and, and computers and all those things to win this victory. As he created heaven and earth at the beginning, he will also win this victory. Simply by the power of his word, he will win the victory uh, over Satan, over the Antichrist, over the armies of the world who are, who are arrayed against him with all the tech of this world. Yet with his word, he will win that victory. It says the armies of the heaven are arrayed in fine linen, white and pure. And what are we doing? What we've always done, what he's called us to always do to follow him. We are following him. Now, now we're following him in victory. What a beautiful thing that is. This is, folks, this is victory. It is sweet. It is beautiful. It is horrific what's about to take place. And yet it, it is the pinnacle of hallelujah to the Lord because he is, he is delivering to his people what he always said he would deliver. He is bringing death against sin and sinners. Verse 15, and from his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations. That, that sword is, is the word. He is the word. That is that living word. It is the powerful word. It is the word that cuts into our very soul. Now it is a word that brings life or death. Here it brings death. With his word, he will strike down the nations. With his word, he will eliminate the enemy. That's it, folks. That's it. With his word, he will simply speak and it will be done. He doesn't have to lift a finger, as it were. He doesn't have to do any of that. With his word, he will win the victory. Folks, that's power. I want you and I to understand that. When, you know, as, as you and I are just living life today, and we're, and we're seeking and, and, and resting on the power of God for victory in our life and the power of God to, to be overcomers, as you and I are resting upon God to have power of witness and power of testimony and and just power of the character of Christ. This is the power that is available to us. It's simply the power of his word in our life. It can do in my life and in your life what it's doing here. His word has the power to change you. It's a matter of faith in his word. Do you and I believe that he is capable of bringing that kind of power, change, influence into your life and mine? With his word, he will bring the victory and he will rule them who? The nations. He will rule the nations with a rod of iron. He's going to rule with righteousness. He's going to rule with authority. He's going to, he's going to uh, rule and reign in the millennial kingdom. His, this, his standard of holiness and righteousness will be enforced and implemented on the earth worldwide. It's not going to be a corrupt rule. It's not going to be a corrupt reign. It will be a reign under the full authority of Jesus Christ. Yes, there will be unbelievers who will be uh, born in the millennial kingdom and who will not choose to receive Jesus Christ. They will, they, will, they will and must submit to the authority of Jesus Christ. Yet we'll find out at the end of the millennial kingdom that there will be many who are not genuinely in their hearts believers, but have submitted 
externally and it will be revealed in the end. He will rule with authority in all the cities and towns and villages. His authority will hold sway. And he will tread the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God the Almighty. This is a moment of fury. This is a moment of God's wrath. As Jesus comes in victory, he is bringing the wrath of God. The wrath of God has been poured out with the, with the, the seal judgments and the trumpet judgments and the bowl judgments. And now the final fury, the final wrath of God is being poured out through the person of of Jesus Christ upon the earth, upon the hostile forces who are arrayed against him. He is God Almighty. On his robe, verse 16, and on his thigh, he has a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. There is no authority on this earth that can stand against this King, against this Lord. He is master over all. He wants to be master over you, over me, he wants to be my authority. He has the right to be my authority. He has the right to be the authority in your life right now as you and I live. His word has the right to be the authority over your life. He is, he is king. When I received him as Savior, when you accept him as Savior, we are accepting his authority over our life. That's the authority with which he is coming here. We're going to see that. So we, we have a description. Jesus here is front and center. This is all about Jesus Christ. All these descriptors have been descriptors of Jesus in the scriptures. Now they are being fulfilled perfectly and with finality in the person of Jesus Christ. As he comes, we see that Jesus is seen by the whole world. He's going to come. The heavens are going to open. He's going to come on a white horse. We go back to Revelation chapter 1, verse 7, and we see this. Behold, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him. Every eye. Everyone will see him. Everyone will know that he is coming, no matter where they live on this earth. They will see him. The heavens will split open and they will see Jesus and the armies of heaven and the host of heaven with him. And he will come and every eye will see him. What will take place? There's a couple different things, a number of things that will take place here as we gather together at this moment. Let's look at some of those. He will fight for Israel. Remember, the tribulation is, a, is God ultimately judging Israel for, for her sin through the ages and yet, and yet now restoring her to grace it's a beautiful picture. Let's see how that unfolds. We see in Zechariah, he uses a descriptor like this of Israel at this time. The nations are staggered by Jerusalem. I'm about to make Jerusalem a cup of staggering to all of the surrounding peoples. On that day, I will make Jerusalem a heavy stone for all of the peoples. All who lift it will surely hurt themselves. All the nations of the earth will gather against it. It's a prophecy that says everyone who will come against Israel will be staggered. They will be destroyed. They will be crippled. They will be ultimately annihilated, we see here. Because God is going to go before Israel in Zechariah 12. On that day, the Lord will protect the inhabitants of Jerusalem. They've, Jerusalem has been destroyed. Jerusalem has been overrun. Jerusalem has been uh, known the taste of, of defeat and... Um, Nations overwhelming her, but Israel has not yet been destroyed as a people. The Lord will protect so that the feeblest among them on that day shall be like David. And the house of David shall be like God, like an angel of the Lord going before them. And on that day, I will seek to destroy all the nations that come against Israel. Romans 11. And this way, all of Israel will be saved. The deliverer will come from Zion. He will banish ungodliness from Jacob. God is going to deliver Israel. Here's what God's going to do. As Jesus Christ is coming and the armies are arrayed against him, and the armies have, here at the end of the tribulation, have overrun Jerusalem. And, and Jerusalem, uh, there are some still in Jerusalem, but many have fled. Okay, we see all of that. And Jerusalem is hanging by a thread to survive as a people, and God will come, and he will intervene, and he will intercede as the armies have gathered from around the world to ultimately destroy Israel, God's people, 
and Christians also who are there, Jesus Christ will intervene. And here's what he's also going to do. He will extend grace. We've, we've seen the two witnesses, the two prophets that come. We've seen the 144,000. We've seen multitudes from every nation, every tribe, every people being saved during the tribulation. I believe Jews are being saved during the tribulation, but yet there's going to be a, a specific, powerful moment of grace that will be poured out upon remaining Israel at this time. Many of the Jews have been annihilated. In fact, we believe there's only a third of the Jewish population alive that started the tribulation. Uh, we've talked about that as we've gone through here. And yet we see here at the end, as Jesus is returning, we see grace. You know what? The grace of the Lord is an amazing thing. It's here all the way through the Revelation. Zechariah 12. Here he pierces their hearts. Grace, folks. I will pour out on the house of David, on the inhabitants of Jerusalem, a spirit of grace and pleads for mercy, so that when they look on me, on him to whom they have pierced, they shall mourn for him as one mourns for an only child. And they will weep bitterly over him as one weeps over a firstborn. See, here's the thing. When Jesus Christ comes, look at this. Look at this. When he comes, it will bring upon Israel repentance. It will bring upon Israel uh, the conviction of sin that will be so strong it will drive them to their knees. And they will mourn. They will recognize that Jesus Christ, as he's coming, is the one that they rejected as a nation and as a people. And they will mourn over that act. They will mourn over that rejection as one who has lost a child. And, 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 they, and they will weep and they will wail. And it will be the, the convicting grace of God over their heart. And when a person is saved, there is always a moment of that convicting grace of God that takes place. Whether it's an emotional wailing or simply the breaking of the heart or brokenness or a contrite heart, there is always the grace of repentance. When you were saved, if it was genuine, there was the moment of the grace of repentance. It hurts, it convicts, it pricks our heart. That's exactly what's taking place here. Revelation 7, everyone will see him, all the tribes of the earth will, and they will wail on account of him. Now all the tribes of the earth will wail on account of him. This wailing is not a wailing of grace. This wailing is a wailing of, of, of utter defeat, this wail, of utter desperation. We're going to see this. But here on Israel's behalf, we're going to see them turn to the Lord. Romans 11. I don't want you to be unaware. A personal hardening has come upon Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. And when the rapture occurred, the church was lifted up to heaven, and this veil was lifted. And in this way, all of Israel will be saved. Now all of Israel who remains on earth will be saved. This is being fulfilled, and this will be my covenant with them when I take away their sins. The days are coming, declares the Lord, and I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel. And so that is taking place, and God is now establishing a new relationship with Israel. One of grace. They don't deserve it. They haven't deserved it. But God is turning their hearts. And this is happening like this. As he's coming, boom, 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 boom. This is all happening at once. Folks, it's, it's like the blink of an eye. Everything is happening at once. And Jesus is coming. And, and, and Israel is breaking before Jesus. Their hearts are breaking. And the world is wailing in defiance. And the world is waiting and wailing in despair. And you've got the world that's wailing before this Savior who's coming. And you have Israel who's wailing in repentance before God. And you have two groups of people here. And you have grace, the grace of cleansing, Zechariah. On that day there shall, be, there shall be a fountain opened for the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem. Oh, cleanse them from sin and uncleanliness. And that's exactly what's going to take place. Salvation for Israel will occur. Transformation will occur. And I will put my law within them. I will write it on their hearts. That's happening right here in this moment. And I will be their God and they will be my people. And no longer shall each one teach his neighbor and each his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me. From the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord, and I will forgive their sin, their iniquity. I will remember their sin no more. And I'm going to cast that aside. I'm going to gather Israel in my arms and pull her to myself. And I'm going to love her who doesn't deserve it, who didn't deserve it. I'm going to extend grace to her. That's God's covenant faithfulness to Israel. I reject covenant theology that says that Israel has had her day and is in the past. The word of God is clear that Israel as a nation 
is going to be drawn back to Jesus Christ and will love he will love her and gather her as a prodigal child as it were and restore her to himself not only is that taking place as Jesus is coming to earth as he's coming with the armies of heaven and the host of heaven Israel is in a moment by the grace of God turning to him in salvation all of them Jesus also gathers the elect Matthew chapter 24 and he sends out his angels with a loud trumpet call and they gather his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other <laughs> and all and, and all of God's people will be gathered together and that will take place and they will be lifted up and we have a passage here that's uh, it's debated much. It's in Matthew 24. Two men will be in a field. One will be taken and one left. Two women will be grinding at the mill. One will be taken and one left. Therefore stay awake, for you do not know on what day your Lord is coming. Remember the context here. This is Matthew chapter 24, verse 31. God is going to gather the elect. He's coming. As he comes with this trumpet call, as he, this isn't the rapture. The rapture has already occurred. There's more than one trumpet call here in Scripture. There's a number of trumpet calls. As he's gathered the church into heaven at the rapture, now as he returns, he, there's a trumpet blast. The, the elect are gathered together here. When the rapture occurred, we were lifted up to heaven. But here the gathering is, is the elect being gathered. The, the gathering here is, is those who have not received the mark being gathered the, and who are alive. The, is the, it is the Jews being gathered together. It is God's people here on earth who are living and alive, being gathered together. And I believe that's the context. We come to this verse here, one is taken and one is left. I believe the one taken is taken to be with the Lord in that moment. The one left is left for judgment because judgment will take place. Some see it just the opposite. There clearly is a distinction, a separation that's taking place here. Those who are unbelievers and those who are believers. Because what God's about to do, I believe, reflects this. I believe God's going to gather his people first. He's going to gather his people. And then we see ultimately what we call Armageddon take place. He's going to overwhelm the enemy. He's going to overwhelm the earth. He's going to overwhelm all the inhabitants of the earth. Psalm chapter 2. The kings of the earth set themselves. The rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed. That's what, that's what the earth has done. Let us burst their bonds apart. Cast their cords from us. And he who sits in heavens, he who sits in the heavens laughs. The Lord holds them in derision. Then he will speak to them in his wrath and terrify them in his fury. And those who are left on this earth in this twinkling of an eye in this moment, not the rapture, but here as he's coming, as he's doing all these various different things, will receive the judgment, the wrath of God. All the ungodly will be judged. Jude chapter 14, Enoch prophesies, the Lord comes with ten thousands of his holy ones. That's innumerable is what that is. To execute judgment on all and to convict all the ungodly. Not convict as in bring them to Christ, but to convict them of their sin, to judge them for their sin. That's what he can do. Isaiah 63 puts it this way, the enemy is going to be trampled down. I've trodden the winepress alone. I trod them in my anger. I trampled them in my wrath. Their lifeblood splattered on my garments. There's that picture again. Stained all of my apparel. I trampled down the peoples in my, in my anger, and I poured out their lifeblood on the earth. This is Armageddon, folks. We think that Armageddon is multiple pieces and parts. It's not just one moment. Here is another piece, a final Armageddon at the end of the tribulation. Then there will be the final Armageddon at the end of the millennial kingdom. There's pieces and parts of the Armageddon. This is another piece of that. This battle, all the armies of the earth are gathered together against Jerusalem, and in that moment, ultimately against Christ as he returns. They didn't know he was going to return as they gather against Israel, but as they gather against Israel, he returns. And now their weapons, their weaponry, their hostility is towards him, and then he will destroy them. Revelation chapter 15. I'm sorry, verse uh, chapter 19, I have, it, I have it written down here wrong. Chapter 19, 
Revelation 19, 17, and I saw an angel standing in the sun. Here we are, verse, verse 17. And he called to the birds that fly directly overhead, Come gather for the great supper of God, to eat the flesh of kings, the flesh of captains, the flesh of mighty men, the flesh of horses and their riders, and the flesh of all men, both free and slave, both small and great. As we've had the marriage supper of the Lamb. I believe that will go into and through the millennial kingdom. Now we have, before that is implemented and takes place, here and that celebration is finalized, here we have the supper of God's wrath, the supper of the birds of prey gathering together. And God calls all of the, all of the birds together to feast upon what will be utter destruction on the earth as man is, is destroyed in its entirety. Verse 20, we see this. The beast is captured. The false prophet also who in his presence had done the signs by which he had deceived those who had received the mark of the beast and those who worshipped its image. And these two, these two, the beast, that's the Antichrist, the false prophet, the two were thrown alive into the lake of fire that burns with sulfur. These are the first two that are thrown into the lake of fire. First two in history that are thrown into the lake of fire. And he comes down in victory, and he grabs these two, and he throws them alive into the lake of fire. It's over. Verse 21. And the rest, the rest of humanity, was slain by the sword that came from the mouth of him who was sitting on the horse, and all the birds were gorged with their flesh. And all of humanity is wiped out. All of unbelieving humanity is wiped out. That's why I believe that the, the elect have been gathered together. I believe that one was taken. That was the believing individual. And all that's left on earth in this nanosecond, in this moment, are unbelievers whom Jesus then wipes out. He kills. Folks, it's a bloody affair. And the birds are feasting and the birds are eating. And it's a terrible moment of God's holiness. And yet it's a moment of celebration for the Church of Christ, for the martyrs of the tribulation, for those who have survived and gone through the tribulation, who are believers, who have been gathered together with Christ, and now see this ultimate destruction and carnage take place. And so Jesus Christ returns, and He comes in heaven, and as He's coming down, there's not a rapture. We've already been raptured to Him. But those who are on the earth, who, who have believed, Israel, who in, who in this moment turns to Jesus Christ as a nation, they're gathered, in, they're gathered instantly with Christ. And then He pours out the, the judgment upon this earth. All believers are wiped out. The armies of the earth are wiped out. They're all killed. And after this moment, there are no unbelievers on the earth who are alive. It is only believers as He now comes down to the earth. And he would descend to earth. We're going to see that, not today. It takes place. Here's, here's the message. Here's the challenge. Here's the reality. The Lord gives us a choice. He's coming back. When he comes back, there will be no choice. There will be no options left. Israel is going to be given grace, but the world will not. The world has made their choice. God's going to extend, God's going to extend grace to Israel in the moment. Because that's his promise. He's promised to restore Israel to himself. Remember his... In the beginning of the chapter, he is faithful and is true. He is true to his promises. He's promised to restore Israel. That's exactly what he does. Isaiah 63, 4. For the day of vengeance was in my heart. It's a descriptor of this moment. And yet the year of redemption had come. Here we see the, here we see the distinction. The vengeance of God upon sin and the deliverance of God, the redemption of God, upon his people. This moment is twofold. It is God's ultimate judgment upon humanity, and yet his redeeming grace upon Israel and those who have survived the tribulation, believers who will be lifted up and then walk through the tribulation with Jesus Christ. That offer is available to you and I today. It's no different. John chapter 3, verse 18 and 16 make it clear. Whoever believes in him is not condemned. Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Those are the two options. Whoever does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the Son of God. Whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God remains on him. Belief and obedience always go together. 
Again, it's not salvation by works. It never has been and never will be. But when we obey God, we are affirming that our faith is genuine in Jesus Christ. We are affirming relationship. When we put our faith and trust in Jesus Christ, we are protected from ultimately this this ultimate wrath of God that we're going to see. There's more that we could say about what's taking place here, but that's coming, not today. Today, the challenge is this. Jesus Christ is coming. We just we look forward to the rapture. That's our next event as the church. Either the Lord taking me home in death or the Lord coming today and he takes me home to be with him. I trust that's where you're at today. We'll go through the, we'll go through the tribulation in heaven with the Lord. And many will be saved during the tribulation who live here on earth. They will be executed. They'll be martyred. They will be lifted up to heaven to be with the Lord. But some will survive. Israel will be saved at the end of the tribulation. They will be given grace. One nation will be given grace. God's chosen people, Israel. And then, and then the millennial kingdom will be about all of God's promises to that nation, Israel, upon the earth. And ultimately to us as well. But you and I, we have a choice to make. I trust you in Christ. It's the most important thing. Are you ready? If Jesus Christ is your Savior, then when the rapture occurs, we'll be lifted up. And then we'll be returning with Him when He comes. We'll be in this host, this army, this army that's as the heavens are split open, we will be in that army who comes with Him. And we will watch from a heavenly seat, from a heavenly viewpoint, all that Jesus Christ does in these final moments. And then much will unfold after that, which we've yet to talk about. I trust you know Christ. That's the most important thing. I trust you have a burden for people who need the Lord. It's the most important thing. May God develop that in your heart. If you're a child of God, it must be true that you care for people who need the Lord and you're willing to speak to them and love them towards Christ. If you're a child of God, that will and must be your passion and your testimony. May that be true for you and I today. Thanks for joining with me, for with us as we're going through Revelation. We'll come back next week and we'll continue. May God bless you this week as you serve Him and love Him. Turn to Him and walk in faith. We'll see you next week.